Hello, my name is Mike Longo. This is the fourth DVD in our series, The Rhythmic Nature of Jazz. So you see, I'm not just saying one, two, three, four, but I'm hitting low note, high note. No matter how I move my hands, the rhythm stays perfect because the energy in the rudiment is perfect. Now the next thing we're going to do is, there's two more warm-ups that go with the work you did on DVD number three before we get into the new stuff. One of the things I need to mention is uh, I've had some feedback uh, over the internet where people uh, are focusing on the drum and ignoring the melodic exercises. And so what I have to tell you is a story about Dizzy and myself. Uh, we were playing in Miami and staying at my parents' home in Fort Lauderdale. And so we were coming back in the afternoon from a gig and uh, we got stuck in a traffic jam. So the whole way back, Dizzy and I talked about Charlie Parker. And Dizzy said something very profound. He said, quiet as it kept, Charlie Parker's contribution was melody. He said, as soon as we heard that, we all knew we had to go that way. Now, one of the things you can glean from that is that bebop was a melodic conception, a new kind of melody that nobody had, had ever heard before. Now, so these melodic exercises, like, like one of the guys that was uh, a, a PhD down south was uh, sort of disagreeing with some of my ideas, and he, what I pointed out to him that he was criticizing the DVDs without watching them. He, it's like somebody criticizing a movie they haven't watched or criticizing a book they didn't read. And so he said, well, hemiolas have been around for a long time. And, I, and I'm saying, hemiolas is just what the drum, that's what the, this drum pattern is called when you mix two and three. Like one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, one and two and three and one and two and three and one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. And so he didn't watch the DVDs, so he missed the whole part about the melodic activators. Now the word activator becomes very important because basically I gleaned all those melodic ideas from Dizzy. And I'm going to ask uh, one of the students here, Isaiah Schoenfeld to describe to you his experience with the melodic activators. So tell him what happened. Two years ago I started studying with Mike Longo and I didn't have very much melodic access on my instrument. After I started doing the Olinga exercise, I noticed that it activated something in my playing and my phrasing changed where I would normally put things in the bar line shifted and my complete concept of time was more whole. I was able to do things that I felt were not correct but came out perfect as he talked about the perfection in the drum exercise. When you tap into this, these activators, they change your, your perception of the rhythm and where you lie in the whole ensemble. Okay, so the whole point is these melodic exercises are extremely important and, and you can't take them lightly because once you play them and you flow right out of the exercise in the stream of consciousness that the exercise puts you in, some behavior starts to unlock in your playing. And so it's basically what's important is what happens after you play the exercise to your playing. <coughs> That'll stay in your playing. In fact, I usually tell students until they get very advanced, before you go to a gig, before you perform, play these exercises because you're going to play a whole different way. So now, what I'm going to give you, this is in conjunction with the work we did on DVD 3. There's two more melodic activators.
Good. Very good. You felt something in your chops, right? Uh, let's have Christian Fabian demonstrate the same thing on the bass. Good. See how the thing got perfect as soon as you hit those sixes in the right yeah. place? Very good. Now we're going to do a new exercise. This is still in conjunction with the work you did on DVD number three. This will be the last one connected to that. And sometimes people, because uh, I always recommend don't play licks. They say, well, Dizzy played licks. But when Dizzy did stuff like, like this, he was not playing a lick. He was playing activators, especially if the rhythm section wasn't gelling with him. He would play something like this. Next thing you know, everybody would be locked up. So he had a few of those type, uh, uh, what you would call like, um, I call them activators. They're actually catalyst. So a, a rhythmic or a melodic idea. Again, keep in mind what he said about melody. It's a melodic idea that un unlocks a behavior in your playing. So Andy's going to demonstrate that for you now. something in your time right yeah and also the melodic phrasing is is uh, kind of happens on its own thank you so you felt a change right yeah very good yeah okay chris morrison is going to demonstrate the same exercise Now we're going to talk about uh, something before we start the very advanced work. This has to do with how to accent. I call it an accentuation principle. Uh, frequently students will play an accent in the wrong place and throw the whole groove off. Dizzy wrote a tune years ago, uh, he beeped where he should have bopped. He was being facetious, but he was on the level.
Good, very good. Now, if you remember when you were studying with me, the first time we did this, you remember you were playing it the other way? Oh, yeah, you yelled at me, yeah, from the other and, room. And, yeah. But then when you did this, you experienced a whole different thing. Yes. Can you yeah. describe that, the effect it had on you? Um, it's almost as if the rhythm helps you choose the note. Um, and just where you feel, like you feel that the upbeats are, are actually, like, I mean, it just makes it very easy to feel poem into the downbeat. It just and it naturally your phrase. But a different behavior opened oh, it up. Much different. Yeah. Okay, when Dizzy said that Charlie Parker's contribution was melody, that's very strongly related to this accent principle. Mm -hmm. Made you play a whole different way, right? Yes. And so those of you at home need to practice this, and once you get into that, you just practice and let the music take you where it's going to take you. You don't impose anything on the music. You can't create music with, feeling, uh, with feelings. You have to create feelings with music. So if you notice, while you were playing, the groove started to come back yeah. to you. You weren't mm -hmm. putting the groove on the guitar. Exactly, yeah. The guitar was putting the groove on you, right? Yes. Very good. All right, now we're going to begin the work that uh, actually this fourth DVD is centered on, and it's something I call continuities. What is a continuity, actually? Actually, what I'm uh, referring to is certain accents or hits that, hurt, uh, that fall in consistent places so that they fall in the same place every time. Now, what's so important about this is in your time conception when you play, if certain continuities are not present, you won't have the groove that somebody like Dizzy or Oscar Peterson, those type players have. Uh, the first one we're going to talk about is a very prevalent one that seems to be eluding a lot of not only students but teachers as well. One of the things Dizzy always said was he filled his bar up with rhythm. What he meant by is if he had to play something on the end of four, one, two, three, four, bap, he would fill the bar up so he'd say, bap, chank, dab, do bap, instead of counting one, two, three, four, and. They bam, tank, do, ba, do, bap. You can't go wrong. However, this first continuity, I, I noticed uh, a teacher on YouTube was telling students uh, to play this quarter note triplet, and it wasn't really a quarter note triplet. This is very important, and it's eluding a lot of people. They think this is what's happening. Made your whole group different, right? Yes, sir. Now, what I'm going to show you now is Christian is going to demonstrate the same thing in him walk. So, one, two, uh, one, two, three. Thank 
Thank you. I should mention uh, what I said before about the activators and trying to imitate an effect. I have a, a drummer who was, uh, he plays with my big band, and I was showing him the cymbal beat. Uh, Dizzy used to sing the cymbal beat, chip pa ching, chip pa ching, and there's an accent on the pa, chip pa ching. And so he said, well, yeah, that's the way Elvin plays, and he started playing it, but he wasn't right. So I told him to play the half note triple, or three against four, ban, do ban, da, 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 chip pa ching, and all of a sudden, the accent started to come out by itself. So there's a big difference between somebody trying to imitate that accent and somebody knowing what causes that accent to occur. And that principle that I just mentioned is throughout jazz, and so it's something I caution all of you to make sure you understand the source of, of a musical phenomena. I think I mentioned this in DVD number one, but now we're going to elaborate on it. And I have a story to tell you. Um, we were playing at the Village Gate, the Dizzy Gillespie Quintet and the Miles Davis Quintet. We actually did nine weeks at the Village Gate and another three at the Club Baron in Harlem. Every night, Miles would come up and sit in with us, so I got a chance to comp behind Miles and Dizzy both, which was uh, a highlight of my life, I, I, a real learning experience for me. But Dizzy walked up to me in the dressing room and handed me a piece of paper with this on it. Then he said to me, you ever see this rhythm? And he walked away. And Moody and I both said, what is, don't make sense, don't make sense. 30, 35 years later, I said, oh my God, I finally see what he's talking about. Now, the implications of this is very deep. Because if you look at it, a whole different language of rhythm occurs from that. That's extremely important. Now what I've done is I've given these students an exercise.
<laughs> All right, thank you, gentlemen. I'm going to talk about something now. To my knowledge, this doesn't exist any place in the education field. I've never heard musicians even speak of this except in New York City. I first became aware of it with Dizzy. And it's a funny story I have to tell you. There's a movie called A Night in Havana. And there's a funny scene in the movie where Dizzy's wife got mad at him because uh, of the answer he gave the lady that was interviewing him. So there's a segment where the lady's interviewing. I have to use a, 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 a medical term because he used a slang term because I, I don't want to offend anybody. But the lady asked Dizzy, where does your music come from? He said, you really want to know? Yeah, he said, from my rectum. Only he used another word. <laughs> now everybody was laughing. He said his wife got mad at him for telling the lady that. But there was a truth in what he's saying. I refer to it as kundalini energy. But there's an energy in the base of your spine. And when I activate that myself, I can actually think down there. I can think my way down there and I feel it vibrate. And when that happens, the tone on the piano changes, the depth of my ideas change, my rhythms all come out right, and there's a spirit present, a spiritual presence. Now Andy uh, Schoenfeld, he is actually a, a, a psychotherapist. So I think he can explain it. I can't explain it in clinical terms or anything like that. But believe me, this is a part of the music. Now, I've only heard a few other musicians mention this in New York City. And they were like very deep musicians, like uh, the real heavyweights. They know about this. Also, other artists, they're not in the music field, knowing immediately what I'm talking about when I mention this, like painters. And so it's an integral part of life. And I think that uh, you need to incorporate this into your music. I meant was uh, transcribing, I, I highly recommend it for ear training mm -hmm. because you have to know like that's the ninth of the chord, that's the eleventh of the chord, you, and, and for that, but you can't learn to play from transcribing for a couple of reasons. Number one, you can't transcribe a touch, mm. and the touch is, when you play these exercises, what is actually changing is your touch. It activates a new behavior on my instrument. Yes, yeah. and so you can't transcribe that. The other thing, if you go back to what uh, Joe Sample said about Charlie Parker, people copying his ideas when that came from his own inspirational being. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of things. When you transcribe and you're playing the transcription, you're not playing your rhythm, man. You're playing somebody else's rhythm. Mm -hmm. And also it, it blocks what we just talked about, the Kundalini. Mm -hmm. And so... There's one, one might play an idea that they hear on a recording or something it can help their chops or something like that. But transcribing somebody else's solo, you're just imitating jazz. You're not playing jazz. You're imitating jazz. And so there's a much hipper way to learn to play from a rhythmic standpoint. For example, if somebody said, I'm going to play the notes of a C minor 7 chord, and they dum, 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 and they say, okay, now make rhythmic. Boom. Boom, bang, bang, show, ba do bang, da bang, bap, bap, ba do bong. Now you say, okay, at the top note, put an upper neighbor tone. Don't, boom, bing, bang, dee, dee, ba do bing, show, do bang, bang. That's the way you learn to play jazz. 
Now, some people say, no, we have to learn a vocabulary. When you're transcribing, you're not learning a vocabulary. You're copying a, you're copying a, a conversation somebody had. Mm. And so plain licks is like somebody says, hey, man, can you tell me how to get to 42nd and Broadway? And you say, apple pie and coffee. <laughs> That's what a lick is. And so uh, there's a much hipper way to learn a vocabulary rather than, because uh, when you were a child, when you learned, you didn't repeat a conversation your parents had. You learned things like apple, give me an apple, take this apple. That's boom, bang, 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 bang. That's the way you learn to play. Mm. Yeah, I have heard it. Uh, Christian. Yes. Didn't Ron Carter say something about that to you? About he said he never transcribed. Yeah, for him it's all about a process. So I'm studying with him for close to three years, and uh, I was a little confused in the beginning of his lessons. But um, the whole idea is that ultimately he teaches his students to learn the way he thinks, and how to uh, you know come up with a baseline and what process you're using, and um, also. Um, improvising in the moment and remembering what you did uh, and then develop an idea that's actually um, next to you just only a few times I heard that in my career as a musician uh, like playing in statement and develop in statement and he uses that in his bass lines when he's accompanying musicians he listens to what they need and what will help them and then he's trying to develop if he's playing let's say if he's playing Birdland for a week then he has a sp certain band together. He's trying to develop the music to the best possible level. He can develop it within a week by the last day. And um, but it's a very creative process. And um, yeah, it, also, it has nothing to do with uh, playing licks or transcribing Ray Brown. Or I mean, although I did that in in my past, but it's a do it's a different thought process. It's a different process to get to that level. Yeah, somebody can be influenced by Ray Brown by listening to him. Mm -hmm. You, by listening, it, it, it starts to come out in your plan because you're influenced through the creative process of listening, listening, not copying. There's a difference between emulation and imitation. Emulating somebody's plan is a correct approach. Imitating it is not. Hi, my name is Andy Schoenfeld, and I had the privilege and honor to be the producer of Mike's DVD series, The Rhythmic Nature of Jazz. I've been a student of Mike's uh, since I'm 19 years old, and uh, I could never say enough of, uh, about what he taught me and shared with me throughout all these wonderful years that I've known him. Uh, when I was 19, he told me what the uh, exercises would do, and he was 100% correct. And as the years passed, he really perfected being able to communicate not what to play in jazz, but how to play it. Uh, this is not just an intellectual concept. This is something that you have to experience. So I urge you to uh, purchase the uh, four-part series and be able to uh, practice the exercises and be able to explore and experience uh, what these uh, DVDs have to offer. Uh, Mike says uh, that uh, this will change your playing experience. And like I said, uh, it's 100% true. And so, uh, once again, uh, all my thanks to Mike Longo uh, for everything that, uh, that he's shown me. And thank you to everyone who has uh, purchased one of the, D the DVDs and uh, has participated in the experience. All right, I'll speak to you soon.